Hey everyone, and welcome to our February live event for National Quilter Circle. Once again, we have Colleen back to answer all of your quilting questions. So thanks for being here, Colleen. Thanks for inviting me back. It's fun. Of course, of course. So uh, first, I want to talk about you have some new quilts behind you. Um, you always have some beautiful quilts back there, but it looks like uh, one of them is a new one. And with the houses, up, I want to know if you uh, paper piece that one or if it's it's regular piecing or what's you know with your new quilts. Um, the one with the houses off to the side here um, probably could have been paper pe paper foundation piece, but um, I'm working on a virtual retreat project, and this is my version for that. And our focus is doing partial seams and set in seams. So all those techniques are rolled into this quilt a little at a time, teaching you those techniques, giving you a chance to repeat those over and over as you create each of the rows in the quilt. So for our virtual retreat coming up the end of March, look into um, what um, National Quilt Circle will be promoting that. See if there's something there that interests you. If you'd like to add a new skill to your um, skill set, maybe jump in and join us and learn some fun new. I know when I say partial seams and Y seams, everybody strikes fear in their heart because they're like, mm -hmm. no, no, no. But we're going to take them very slowly. We're going to repeat them enough times that you will have um, a very good grasp of how to use them in different places and how to have success when when working with those kinds of um, seams that are a little bit different than we normally do in piecing. Yes, absolutely. But it's always good when you say repetition, because like you said, if you don't get it the first time, by the time you finish the project or even halfway through it, you're going to be a pro. Exactly. And they say that it takes at least seven times of doing something to start getting familiar with it. So yeah. Definitely going to see it seven times before you. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Glad we hit that number. All right. Um, next one here. Um, Susie says, which batting has the softest feel and best drape for making a quilt out of silk blend kimonos? And what fabric do you think would work best for the backing? Silk blend kimonos. That would be a fun. Yeah. And it would feel wonderful. On, oh, um, I am kind of thinking that possibly a wool batting because it's very airy, it's very soft and drapeable. Um, it's a there's washable wools out there. A lot of times when I, when people hear the word wool, they're like, "Oh no, <laughs> I'm not going there." Because wool has different um, properties about it. In the past, that were it, it shrank a lot, it was itchy, and all those things. But the wool battings that they've created today are washable wool and the one quilt that i have that has wool in it that i absolutely love is the most soft drapeable quilt um, it was hand quilted by um, a mother of a friend of mine but it is extremely soft and very drapeable so maybe look into a wool batting as a possibility for that quilt that would that would give you that soft cozy not stiff um, and you're not going to want to over quilt either, because the more you quilt something, the more thread you add to it, the stiffer or more structure or bones you're putting into it. So it makes it a little less um, soft and drapeable. So maybe then look into a very loose bat, um, type of stitching, not, not very dense quilting when you do that project. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then do you have a suggestion for the backing fabric? The backing fabric. Um, you might want to look into, um, if you like that soft feel, they do create or uh, have created some sateen backing fabrics. Um, they come in extra wides. I know even the shop that I work in, we have a few that are sateen. So it has that, the, um, the float fabric, the fibers that float almost like a satin. So, but it's cotton. Um, it would have to be pre shunk beforehand because the kimonos that are silky, wouldn't shrink the same. So you'll want to make sure that it's pre-shrunk, but look into a sateen fabric. That would be a really nice backing fabric for that. Perfect. All right. Our next one here, Julie asks, I always feel like I ruin my quilts when I quilt them. I have tried freehand and stitching in the ditch and never liked the final result. Uh, would you suggest a quilting ruler? And if so, how do you use them? 
Mm. Quilting rulers, well, that's a really good question because a lot of us felt like that when we started. <laughs> we, we jump in and we're like all the confidence in the world and then we get a ways and think, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> the biggest thing is just keep going because mm -hmm. usually what happens is as you step back when you finish, the little imperfections that may be there kind of just become part of the quilt, part of the story of the quilt. And mm -hmm. your eye doesn't really usually go to those right away. It's the overall effect that you're looking for. So just um, keep practicing. Um, rulers can add a little bit of a different dimension um, to your quilting. They do take some time to practice with. So you'll want to do practice pieces with rulers. Um, there are quite a few different companies and different designers out there who have created rulers. I'm not sure if you're working on the long arm or if you're working from your domestic machine, but both have um, large groupings of rulers available that can be used. Like I said, it does take time to learn the technique of holding the ruler and placing it, um, but there are some really great videos out there um, connected to each of the companies and designers of those rulers out there. So I would do a little bit more research, practice, realize that your quilt is yours. You're making a unique piece. It doesn't have to be perfect. It it um, is unique to you and it's your signature that you're putting on your quilt. So um, kind of relax about it being not perfect, perfect, and realize that you're creating your own signature as you work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I was going to say, I think that having the, the quilts behind you is a good example of I mean, you see the quilt, but like, I can't see the quilting on the quilt, right? And even like, you could turn around and you may not even be able to see all the quilting either. So like, when you're doing it and you're six inches away from it, you're going to see everything. But when you actually use it or gift it, you know, you're not going to be as up close and personal with it. <laughs> exactly. And the other thing is to maybe, maybe pick a quilting thread that is a little bit more camouflage. Try not to use a strong cr contrast in your quilting thread because that can also help kind of hide those imperfections like the gray and pink quilt behind me. If I would have used a bright, hot pink thread, you would see all of the quilting on it. But I used a medium gray so that it just kind of melts into the background. It creates the texture, but doesn't scream, look at me. So sometimes yeah. that also helps. Yes, perfect. All right, Geraldine asks, if you make a quilt with photos, does it last as long as a regular quilt? Mm, I don't know for sure if there's a lot of research yet on how long the printed or trans photo transfer kind of um, inks will last on, on fabrics. Um, they haven't been around, they've been around for a while, but they haven't been around 50, 100 years yet. So um, I don't know if the jury's really out on that yet. Uh, make sure that you always um, follow the instructions for either heat setting or setting those inks to get them to last as long as possible. Um, the other thing is that um, washing is always something that pulls inks and dyes out of fab fabrics. So probably washing it as least the amount as possible if it has to be um, washed at all. Um, it may be a wall hanging so that it won't need to be laundered. Um, but there's really no way to know at this point. We just don't have enough historical record to tell us. Um, we can we see through history and quilts in museums that inked things have lasted a long time, like labels and names on quilts. So a lot of times those kinds of things will last quite a while. It's just that the inks that we use in printers and in ink transfer kinds of things for photos, I, I don't know enough about personally to give you the longevity on those, I'm afraid. Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, and next one here, Elizabeth asks, what type of batting, cotton, poly, wool, etc., do you suggest for what projects? And when would you suggest using a double batting? I did a quilt as you go mm -hmm. and made the mistake of double batting. The seams were murder. <laughs> yeah, and quilts as you go, that would be tough because you're leaving the little seam allowances that you have to have access to to join your pieces together and that extra thickness in there could be an issue and probably was. Um, usually if you, um, when you look, 
when you purchase batting or when you're looking at battings to purchase, there is usually um, recommended use for those battings that will tell you about them. So every company produces battings that are a little bit different in weight and use. Um, I tend to use the 80-20, which is mostly cotton, but some poly in there. It reduces the cost of the batting somewhat. 100% um, cotton is usually more expensive um, than the blend. It still has that shrinkable kind of uh, property that I like in my quilts. Um, the biggest thing is you need to think about the use of the quilt. It's, if it's going to be a baby quilt and it's going to um, get used and taken back and forth from daycare to the car to home back and forth a lot and may need to be laundered a lot, it may, may need to be a batting that easily dried um, so that it in the laundering process it doesn't take long for it to get back out of the dryer and go on the road again and 100 polyester does work in that um, in that realm very nicely it doesn't give you it gives you a fluffier quilt it doesn't give you the crunchy um, uh, antique look or feel to the quilts um, 100% cotton in the 80-20 or a blend of cotton and poly will give you that more shrunk uh, crinkly look um, that's my preference, but everyone has their own. Wool, like I've said earlier, is extremely warm. It's lightweight. It's been created to be a washable wool, so that's a good batting for something that you want to be really warm. A lot of a lot of times the, the, you um, might go to using a double batting if you're wanting to have the quilting extremely noticeable. So it has raised areas so that maybe you put a cotton batting down first and then a wool or a poly bat over the top. That gives a place for the thread to sink down into the quilt top and have raised areas. Maybe if you're doing feathers or flowers or something like that, it'll give you extra dimension to your quilt. Um, it's going to add weight to the quilt. So think about that so that if it's going to be a bed quilt, it will add extra weight to the almost like a weighted blanket to, to your bed. So think of that. Um, usually I tend to just go with a single bat and that 80-20 blend is my favorite, but everyone has, some people like a really flat or you live in a warmer climate. You want that flatter um, look to your quilt. It's not gonna add a lot of weight. So maybe the 100% cotton that's a real flat, um, like warm and natural will be the ticket. So really think about the climate that quilt's gonna be used in, who's gonna be using it, um, and maybe even the process by which you're gonna quilt it. Because if you're going to do um, quilt as you go, you're gonna to wanna to not have that thickness right up against the seam allowances that you're gonna to have to use to join your strips or your pieces together. So you kinda of have to think through the process a little further down the road, kind of like in a chess game. So mm -hmm. that if it's good here, but is it going to be good, next week or the week after when I have to do this next process. So you have to kind of be considering those things. Absolutely. All right, next one here, Elizabeth asks for an art quilt, something from a picture. How do you know where to place the pieces of fabric? I would like to know how to start doing something like that. Okay, so art quilts. I have not done them myself, but I have known quite a few people who have. The biggest thing, if you're creating one yourself as an original, is to create your uh, a map of your quilt. And it might be that you draw out um, approximately how you want this to look, or if you are using a photograph and you're going to transfer that into fabric, is to do a tracing of it so that you have a positioning of all the pieces and then take it um, to a copy place, some place that can enlarge that to the size that you're going to want your final quilt to be so that you have um, a roadmap that is in like size to what you're actually working on. And you can cut pieces from that. You could, may need two or three copies of it if you're gonna cut some of it apart. And then, but you wanna keep um, that original intact so that you can use that for placement. And you can um, also trace that on to um, clear, um, what have people used in the past? I've seen people use things like even press and seal. Um, they've used clear um, the file for putting pieces of paper into to protect page protectors. Oh, even yeah, yeah. The shapes, and so that they can overlay it onto 
um, the area where they're going to be working. And underneath, you're sliding your pieces around, you get them in place. It does take some patience. It's like putting a large puzzle together. Um, but having that original so that you can reference, say, this this piece of the of a mountain has to be so many inches over and so many inches down from the corner. So you have a reference and, and work that way, um, not fusing things down until you get them in the place in the uh, right position first. But mm -hmm. those are things you need to research because um, there are some things to take into consideration when you're working on an art quilt. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. Um, Jeannie asks, my brother brought me a quilt that I made for him almost 40 years ago. It's threadbare in a few places and all the way around the sides. And he'd like for me to see if I can help it, but I don't even know where to start. So how would you help her? Oh, this is, I've seen this happen more than once. Um, and he probably still loves that quilt and wants to use it, which is a, a shout out to the quilter who created something that is so well loved. That's amazing, number one. So shout out to you as a quilter, good job. Um, the next thing is that the probably the best thing you can do is to find replacement fabrics, recut pieces and maybe applique them over the areas that are worn through, or you could possibly even take out the stitches around each piece, slide a new piece in there and hand stitch it down. Now, if there's quilting that goes through those areas, that could be an issue. <laughs> so you may have to re-quilt those areas also. But let's hope there aren't too many of those, but um, appliquing over the top would probably be the less disturbing of all of the things going on. You wouldn't have to take out quilting stitches. You could just stitch them over the top and then kind of mimic the um, quilting through those areas. Now, if it's binding, you could just take off the binding and replace binding. That could easily be um, can easily be done. Um, I have taken off binding on quilts that were 70 or 80 years old. There really wasn't much left to take off except two little pieces because it had torn down the fold. And so replacing that binding does help the quilt last a while longer. Um, otherwise, it could just be that it becomes a quilt that um, isn't used but just displayed and loved in the in the state that it is, but kind of sounds like he still wants to use it. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> All right, Amanda asks, are there any beginner projects that NQC does as a group, um, like a table runner or a simple quilt or a block of the month? I get a lot out of sharing with others and seeing how others are doing things and being a part of something while I learn. I feel a little alone in my quilting journey. I think a lot of us have start, felt that way in the very beginning. National Quilt Circle does has, have a lot of um, small clips on techniques and things. There are different um, challenges along the way. There are different quilt alongs that come up. So I would say search through the site, see what you can find there. Um, follow them on with a Facebook because there's always um, things you can learn from quilters along the way. They're, mm -hmm. They constantly challenge even me, and I'm thinking, oh, what would be, th what would I do in that case? <laughs> so you have a large pool of talent that you can ask questions and feel very um, comfortable there because we all were beginners once, and we knew what it was like to get started and not know a thing about what in the world, all the terminology because we have kind of our own language in the quilt world, and all these different tools to look at and how they work. So. I would say look for the videos, the free videos to see, you know, learn techniques and tools there and, you know, follow along on Facebook so that you can, you know, jump into different quilt alongs and things that come up. Yeah. And there are always um, challenges coming up and that is a special um, Facebook group page as well. And that's definitely one where you can really interact with other people as well. So our next one, Terry says, I have scorched my wool pressing mat. Is there something I can do to correct that area? Uh, <laughs> once wool is scorched, there isn't much you can do to it, I'm afraid. Um, just set your iron setting a little lower. Usually it's because people have had their iron set too hot and, or in, in too uh, left it in one space too long. It got too warm. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot at this point. Um, I even have to admit that I know of one in the shop where I work where someone scorched it too. So it doesn't <laughs> change the, its usability. It's just the aesthetics of it. So at this point, um, 
sad to say, just flip it over and you can keep moving. <laughs> That's good to say. Perfect. Yeah, it's either that or make a slip cover for it out of a you know out of a thin cotton, and you know it's still going to work. If the heat's still going to be reflected. There's going to be a layer of cotton maybe between you and the wool, but it, it's still usable. Oh, for sure. For sure. All right. Helen asks, my biggest issue with quilting is picking the fabrics that go together. Is there any trick to picking colors, patterns, big or small? Um, it is a challenge at the very beginning. Um, we tend to want to either match everything or use the same texture too much or the same scale. So, um, my biggest thing was to search through designs online or in other books, look at what other people have put together and not just breeze over it, but to actually study what they put into their quilt. If you see a quilt you really love and, and, and you think, oh, I need to save that picture. No, before you save it, zoom into it. Look what were the size of the scale of the prints. How many did they use? Actually make a list so that you get used to saying, well, I love this quilt. It's blue and white. And so then when you go to store, you pick out one blue and white. But if you look at it, there are actually five different blues in there that create depth and dimension and have texture to them so that you start to realize, OK, in order to make maybe this two color quilt, I may need to pick out five blues that go together and then is that white background solid white or does it have some texture to it also? So that you see what other people are doing, things that you're drawn to and learn from them because easily we can we can fall in love with a quilt, go on say, I'm gonna make that someday, but never study how it's actually put together, what, what appeals to you in texture and color and dimension. And I know it took a while for me and I was working in a quilt shop at the time when I became a quilter. So I was still green at it and people would ask me to help them. Well, I would pull out just about everything in a color range and tell them they have the right of first refusal. They could put anything back, but anything in this range would work. And they would usually look at me like, you're crazy. But then they would realize I need, I need a green for this, but I don't need just that's you know a really plain green. This green texture might be really interesting in a different size or scale than the other things I'm putting it with. So that they start to look at not just the color range, but the size of the, of the pattern. And if it's a tone on tone, if it has other colors in it. So all those things make a really good quilt when we're done. It's not just about picking out three fabrics, but maybe three fabrics that have various scale, um, different textures in them so that we kind of get out of our quilt, our quilt comfort zone. I see quilters a lot of times come in and they'll want to pick out these certain fabrics. And I'm not going to name them because they are great fabrics, but they're all the exact same design. And I'm like, could we throw a couple other things in there? And then they're like, Oh, I didn't think about that. So, um, and also the other thing is when you get back to quilt shops, I know that not everyone can get back in a quilt shop right now, but talk to the people working there. Look what other people are, are working on because you're standing in line to have fabric cut. Possibly the person ahead of you may have a really good grasp of texture and design. See what they're working on because that's how we learn from each other. We're a community. Absolutely. Um, Barb says, what kind of thread should a person use? Not necessarily for the quilting, but for the sewing part. Um, one that's available. <laughs> <laughs> During the shutdown, if you could get a spool of thread, you were doing really good. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to use a polyester thread because it's available. and But there are 100% cotton threads out there that are wonderful too. So it really is a personal choice. Some quilters need and, and feel the need to have 100% cotton fabric, which is correct, 100% cotton batting, which is an option, and 100% cotton thread, which is also an option. So um, the other thing is that every sewing machine kind of has a personality. Some don't like certain brands of thread. I have a girlfriend who, when she puts... Uh, what I would call a higher quality thread because it does cost more in her machine. It, it doesn't like it. And she's done everything and had technicians look at it. It doesn't like that, that brand of thread. 
So <laughs> the answer is a thread that your sewing machine works with and that you like. So in a combination, um, I tend to go towards Aurifel. I've used Mettler. Um, I've used, oh, I got to think about the Quilter Select. Um, I've used Madeira. So eh, I've used Wileye. There's just so many. Uh, Superior Threads are great. There are so many different ones. So try them all out because sometimes we want a really fine thread as we're putting our um, piecing together because we don't have bulky th thread in our seams. Sometimes we want a thicker um, thread for the actual quilting because we want to see the quilting. So mm -hmm. it kind of depends on the, the use that um, your quilt project and what pr portion of the quilt you're in at this point and what to use. Sorry, that's kind of a non-answer. <laughs> it's an answer. It's an answer with multiple options. So I like it. All right. Bonnie asks, um, I want to use a pieced top as a duvet cover. How should I finish the top to make it work? Okay. Uh, I've seen people do this before. I haven't done it myself, but as a duvet cover, it's going to need to come off and on that filling piece that goes the actual duvet inside. So you're not going to want to have raw edges against the duvet because it's going to lint and cause a disaster. So what you can do is use um, just a piece of muslin in the back. You could quilt to that. It won't create dimension. Um, if you want to have some dimension in there, you can actually quilt with a really um, lightweight polyester or a very thin batting, cotton batting in there. Something that makes it look like a quilt, but it's got to have something on the back of your quilt top in order to, for it to go, go off and on that um, the inside piece without getting destroyed and, and in the motion of being used, or even if it's just there for, for looks, maybe you may not actually sleep under it but you want it to have some structure to it because just as a top, if you were to finish that off with your duvet, um, a backing for it to slide in, there wouldn't be any support for all the seams in your quilt top. So you need to have something on the back. So at least, um, even if it's just a layer of quilter's cotton on the back of it, so that you um, either tie or stitch through that in certain sections to have it give it some structure, some stability, because even just a movement on and off the bed is going to give tug on those seams. And the reason why we put that batting and backing there really is to give our quilt structure, to give them kind of a, a skeleton to hold it together, because as a top, it's very lightweight. And in, I think in Europe, they even call it a flimsy. So yeah. it would be very flimsy without something to give it some, some backbone. So yeah. look into those things. All right, next one here, Sharice asks, what do you think about washable silk batting? That is also a possibility. I have not used it. Um, it's out there. It's a little bit more expensive. It would be very soft because it has that, um, it doesn't have a very, um, the silk batting, I believe it looks a lot like the wool batting. It's very light and airy. So that's a good possibility as is using, um, something lighter weight, a little bit more fluffy. It would have a, a real soft drape to it. I wouldn't want to over quilt it again because it would, you know, cause anytime you put more stitching in, you cause a stiffness to occur. So um, a more loosely quilted, um, but silk would be fun to put in. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right. Um, Kathy asks, what are these red glasses used for viewing quilt fabric? Have you seen these? Oh, yes. <laughs> I think I have some actually in my other studio. Um, they are so that you can actually see value and takes away the color, which is kind of like if someone says you're wearing rose colored glasses, everything is pink, <laughs> but you still see the texture. You still see things through that color. What it does is negates the blues and the greens and all those colors. And so then you see value almost like taking your phone and taking a picture of your quilt and then changing it to the black and white version mm -hmm. so that you're just seeing value. How dark is the darkest piece of my quilt or in the fabrics that I'm considering for a quilt and how light is my lightest so that you don't create a quilt unless you're trying to create a low volume um, 
change in color, it will give you that depth of darks and lights and helps you to see maybe as you're arranging them on a design wall, that maybe you have too many dark values grouped together in one section of the, of the quilt and then give you time to kind of move your blocks around and kind of disperse that color. So mm -hmm. they, they are helpful, especially if you're not used to looking at colors and saying, well, is that you know a darker value or a lighter value or does everything read medium? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a way to to kind of wake up and see that from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Um, Sylvia asks, will you quickly explain quilt as you go? I'm new to quilting and I'm exploring new ways to quilt. Okay. Trying to explain that quickly is kind <laughs> of a, da a, a daunting task. Um, typically, when we create quilts, we sandwich things together. So we have backing fabric, we've got batting, and we've got a quilt top. And we're stitching down through those all as the whole thing is kind of layered together like a big peanut butter sandwich. Um, and quilt as you go, you're working on smaller portions of the quilt at once instead of the entire quilt top. It may be a strip through the quilt or it could be individual blocks. And you're going to layer just that block with batting and backing. That makes it easier to manipulate and move under the domestic sewing machine if you don't have access to a long arm or you want to say, I made the entire quilt myself. That's a, a one road to go. But when you're working on those blocks, then you only have a block or a strip. Maybe you've joined four pieces together in one long strip and you're going to quilt that section first, then work on to the next section and then maybe the last, and then you're gonna join those together. So what you have to do is allow seam allowances on the areas that you're going to be joining together so that you don't quilt all the way out to the very edge of the strip or the block itself. Um, so that you leave those seam allowances, so those seam allowances can then be joined together. And then the back has to be done, finished by hand. So there are strips put on the back. So if you were to Google um, quilt as you go, um, look to see what National Quilt Circle, I think they probably have something there that covers um, quilt as you go techniques. On the back, then strips are, are put in place to cover over the batting and your seam allowances and then hand stitched to cover that opening or that seaming down through the quilt or between blocks if you do it that way. Hmm. It's kind of a chunking off the quilt one piece at a time or one strip at a time instead of trying to tackle the entire thing at once. Yeah, absolutely. It was a perfect quick quick explanation. I don't know what you were worried about. <laughs> All right, Heather asks, do you have any suggestions for needle size and thread weight when working with a quilt top made of batik fabric? Okay, batik fabric is usually, typically, very tightly woven. So that means the gray good, the base fabric that they use to dye those fabrics is very tightly woven. And usually you can tell that by holding it up to the light. On typical quilt fiber, you can see a little bit through the weave, but in a batik fabric, those fibers are very tightly woven and very um, tightly packed together. They need to absorb a lot of the dyes when they're making those in, in order to be that intense color. So when you're working with a batik, usually a finer needle is the better. So I would work, um, if it's a hand needle, um, I tend to go to straw needles myself because they are really fine. Um, I use a straw needle when I'm doing binding because even if it's a, a any kind of fabric, it makes a very small bite into the fabric. But it, those finer needles are the ones to use. If you are working on um, quilting or piecing, you can go to a finer needle. Um, most of the time, most of us would run maybe a um, an 8012 needle or a 9014. You can um, go to a try a 10 in your machine and see how that works. The only thing is when you go down too small in your needle, that means that the, the little cup area that um, that goes down the center of your needle is where the thread also rides down into the fiber or into the fabrics. 
And if that becomes too small, then the fibers, you know, the uh, machine may skip stitches. So you gotta kind of find that, that little fine spot between skipping stitches and making small holes because you don't want huge holes in your, in your piecing or in your quilting. So find the spot where your machine um, likes the size of needle and the thread combination with your, with your fabric. So it's gonna take a little bit of a test. Somewhere from a 10 to a 12 probably is where you're going to end up at. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We have someone here that um, shared a tip about picking out the colors and fabrics. Another suggestion is to look at the colors that are on the selvage edge because it shows all the colors used in that print. So you can select solids or prints that have those similar colors. So, yes, perfect. Tip. Thank you for that. <laughs> All right, um, Honey asks, I've been hanging my quilts on a curtain rod with these little clips, and it looks beautiful, but a friend says I'm ruining the quilt with the clips. What is your opinion? These are simply wall art quilts, no larger than 48 by 60 or even smaller. I, I would say you're probably fine. <laughs> I've done the exact same thing in my own home. Um, you could transfer and put a pocket on the back so that a pocket – uh, a fabric that's right near the, the binding along the top. And then you could actually put the curtain rod through that pocket to hang it that way. Some people feel that when by putting those clips along the top that too much stress is just along those points along the top of the quilt. But a 48 quilt isn't very wide. So I'm assuming that it's not extremely heavy and shouldn't distort the top edge. I guess if you're trying to preserve that quilt for the next 150 years, <laughs> A rod pocket on the back would be uh, maybe a, a better choice, but it is your quilt, so your choice. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you want a video on how to do a hanging sleeve, I may or may not have just watched a video that you did um, on how to add one to the back of a quilt either before or after the binding has been attached. So even if it's already complete, you show us how you can still add that on anyway. So exactly. uh, that way, if you want to make your friend happy, you know, you add on that. <laughs> Well, and the other thing is maybe some people may say that the clips are metal and that the metal against the fabric could create um, a moisture point that may cause a rust spot on the fabric. So what you could do to pacify everyone is to take those clips. If you can figure out a way to hold them open long enough to cover the clip with something like a clear acrylic or even a clear nail polish, Something that would put a buffer between the metal and your fa and your fabric, that would make her happy. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. I like it. All right. Um, Elizabeth asks, a lot of patterns look so complicated. How do you suggest beginning a complicated pattern? Read through the pattern, sleep on it, read it through it again, <laughs> sleep on it some more. A lot of times the design is created when, when multiple blocks or pieces or units come together. So what if... You look at a design and say, I have no idea where to start. Hopefully, the writer of that pattern has broken it down into units, simple pieces that can go together. Um, usually that way, you kind of bite it off one step at a time. And I know, Ashley, I was, as I follow you on Facebook, you're always making units and then the units make these fabulous designs. So by just taking one step at a time, if it's creating four patches or nine patches, those are simple units to create. But when they get combined with some flying geese that you've made on another day, you, you can create this elaborate design that is amazing. So looking through the directions, looking for one unit at a time within the design, say, OK, I understand this part. Don't try to hold the entire thing in your head all at once, because that's the purpose of a pattern is to bite it off into pieces so that we can digest it step by step. So taking and just focusing on one unit at a time, checking that off as a success, and then moving on to the next unit. Um, look for patterns, talk to quilters, look for pattern writers that they think are um, efficient in the way that they lay out a pattern, um, are accurate, are easy and, and clear to follow. Um, Talk to people in quilt shops. Look through the books. If you open it and see a ton of words and your eyes just glaze over, that may not be the pattern for you. Look mm -hmm. for patterns that have good diagrams, color coding, and are succinct. Those are the ones that you'll have the most success 
But just remember, it's one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that that's what's fun about um, even being on the design side is you can make something look super complicated, even though it's made up of really, really simple units. So once you get more or you've done it longer, you know, you can start recognizing, oh, that's just a flying geese. That's just a half square triangle. It's just the way it comes together. So once you can start recognizing these basic or simple units, um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of patterns are going to not look as complicated as you thought they once looked, which is a great feeling. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> All right. Maureen asks, can I use a sheet that is 100% cotton for the backing? You can use anything as a back for your quilt. Mm -hmm. That's always your choice. It's not always my favorite choice. Um, the biggest situation I tend to run into is it is hard to find 100% cotton. So if you found 100% cotton, that's great. You know that that is um, fiber wise, it will match the fibers of your quilt top. But look for the density and the quality of that of that sheet first, because you've put a lot of hours into your quilt top. The back deserves to be a high quality at the same time. And sometimes we have Sometimes done is good, and if that's where you're at, then go for it. That's fine. It is your quilt. It is your choice. At some point, try try quilters' cottons from you know quilt shops to see how that um, varies compared to maybe what you've used in the past. So don't think that that's the only thing you can use. Realize that there are 100% cotton fabrics out there that are the extra wides because maybe your quilt is 106 inches or 105 inches. And you're thinking, I have to buy three long pieces of fabric and that's so expensive. Mm -hmm. Check online, there are some fabulous 100% cotton extra wide backings. So you only have to buy one length, you have at least 108 in one direction. So if your quilt is maybe 105, maybe you need to get, that'll cover the narrow direction of your quilt, but you can buy enough length off the bolt to accommodate the quilt top that you're creating. And they aren't horribly expensive. It is cheaper to go that route than to buy, say nine yards of quilters cotton that are 45 wide. Um, you don't have as much variation for design and color, but there are a lot more choices than there used to be. So look for 108 wide or 120 wide even, um, extra wide backing fabrics as a possibility. So weigh that out, what they feel like, what your budget can allow and do what works best for you. Yeah, absolutely. And definitely a lot of, a lot of places, not even big box stores that sell fabric, which I know is something that lots of people like to avoid sometimes, but I mean, they do offer the extra wide backing usually in solid colors or simple tone on tones or something. And then of course, big box stores like that are always having those coupons, right? So <laughs> You know, you can inexpensively find the extra wide batting. All right. Next one here. Just started quilting. Can't stop. And I'm already working on another. How do you manage sitting for long periods? I spend up to hours on the machine. Ah, well, welcome. Number one, welcome to the quilt community. We love that you've joined us. The other thing is you need to actually build breaks into your quilting day. Um, sitting for long periods is not good for us. It's not good for our circulation. It's not good for our overall health. And as a quilter, we want you healthy and we want you here for the long haul. So if you have to take your phone and set a timer to get up and go do something, um, even if it's a walk up and down the stairs in your home or in your complex to walk around the block and back, but you need to take care of yourself. So set that timer so that you get up and do move while you're still progressing on your quilting because like I said, sitting for long periods and I realize I do it myself sometimes. And I, then I realize, okay, so if I load the washing machine before I start, I know that buzzer is going to have to go off to get it to the dryer and I don't want it sitting here all day. So I'll hear it. I'll get up and move it to the dryer and then put another load in the washer. <laughs> you see the cycle going on here, right? My alarm is my washing machine and my dryer, but Whatever works, right? Get up and move because you need to be healthy in order to be creative. It also helps our brains to get that blood moving and um, be healthy. Yeah. 
See, I like that you use that as your timer. I would just ignore the washer and dryer. Like, I'm just not going to do the laundry. That's pretty much what I'd be doing. But um, I have seen other people, too. Like, I, the way I like to set up my sewing room is I don't like to have to get up, right? So I sew here. I cut here. I press here. I just, I just pivot. But, I mean, you could always set up your space to where when you need to go press, you need to get up to go press or you need to get up to cut the next thing or, you know. So there's there's tons of ways to do that. Exactly. And yeah. it's it, sometimes it's a challenge. And, and I used to do that myself because in the summertime when my kids were home, I needed to be able to keep an eye on them. So I put my sewing machine at the kitchen table so I could see out into the backyard. I could tell who, where the neighbor kids were, what was going on. But I left my iron in the basement because I knew with kids running through, that wouldn't be safe for the iron up there because they just don't pay attention to what's going on around them. So I would have to walk the stairs to get to the iron which was probably really good for me. I should do that again. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See, and my timer is my one-year-old, so he's always you know, doing something. So. Exactly. All right. Um, Lenny asks, this is something that's driving me crazy. Sometimes my seams in my quilt top open and seem like they have melted. Do you think it might be that my iron is being too hot? I'm having a hard time visualizing this, so I'm, I'm mm. being curious for your answer. Yeah. Um, there's two things to consider. How old is your iron and is it spiking the temperature and not keeping it even? And number two, are your fabrics 100% cotton? Because if there's a little bit of poly in there and you have a hot iron, you're going to get that glazed look in your seam allowances. So check to make sure, see if you can figure out if that your, your fabric source is actually 100% cotton or if it has some poly blend in there because that might be the culprit. Um, the other thing is, do think about possibly purchasing a new iron if it's been a long time since you've, you've bought an iron. I did have an iron once that I'm surprised I didn't burn my house down. Um, I was sewing and I went to press something. And when I went to press, the temperature on my iron spiked. And I could smell as I moved it across the fabric that something was wrong. Mm -hmm. And it spiked to the point where it melted the fabric on my ironing board and scorched my fabric. Mind you, I unplugged it promptly. It never came back on again because it, the entire thermostat, you know, that causes it to come on and off to stay even had totally gone out. So hmm. beware. It might yeah. be something in your iron too. So yeah, a couple things to consider. Just another reason to go shopping for more supplies. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Betty asks, my daughter wants me to make a quilt from her children's burp pads. They are made from cotton diapers. Do I need to use stabilizer on the back of each one like you do for a t-shirt quilt? And can I use a flannel for batting? Okay. Yeah, those lightweight fabrics, they're going to be hard to keep in a square or rectangle shape without some kind of stabilizer on the back. So I would definitely look into um, oh, shape flex or something on the back so that it's a, um, a woven fabric that has a fusible on it so that you can put that to the back. It'll help keep the shape. And you're not going to want to handle them a lot because they're, um, it, it's something that you, cut, you fuse, cut, and get sewing right away so that um, you can create the, the shape and the design that you want without having a lot of raveling because again, they're also very loose woven usually too. So um, if they're made out of a knit, I don't know exactly. Some are knit. Sometimes those burp cloths are more like a gauze fabric. So stabilizing them um, is the ticket to get um, a good result. Flannel can easily be used as a back or as a um, layer in as your batting. Um, Years ago, they would call that a summer quilt mm -hmm. so that it doesn't add weight to it. It's just something as, as kind of the bones on the inside. So you can easily use a layer of flannel in the place of batting. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Um, Pam asks, what do you suggest to do for vintage quilt tops that have had the colors bleed onto them? I haven't washed them. They just got wet during a flood. Hmm. Well, there's a lot of things out there. Um, there are different products to actually wash quilts in that don't have a lot of phosphates in them that are, are gentle on color. If it's bled, it may be too late. Um, that That's just going to maybe be its new complexion. Um, you can try 
Um, gentle things like those quilt washes. I've also heard people use vinegar, um, Dawn dishwashing soap that's been diluted. Um, it's an attempt to get it out, but it may not come out completely. So it, it just might become the new normal for that quilt. Sad that, that happened, but at least you still have it as a memory. So mm -hmm. just, just preserve it as is. I would um, look into the quilt wash though, because that may take any yellowing out and remove any loose dye at the same time. So mm -hmm. um, there are those kinds of products online that um, you can purchase. All right, Shelly asks, I'm making a quilt in blacks and whites. What color thread should I use? Okay, thread for just piecing? I'm not Let's sure. go piecing and quilting. Go ahead and cover. Cover yeah. both, okay. Um, in the piecing process, I would probably use a neutral gray. Just because if anything were to show in the seams, a gray will be the most easily camouflaged. Um, when it comes to the quilting, it may be that you decide to change colors in the two different areas. If it in, in a black that is very solid or semi-solid, there won't be any place for the thread to hide. So it's gonna be very, very visible. Maybe a dark gray would be the best there. You'll be able to see the texture. You'll see the thread a little bit, but it won't scream on there. On the white areas, I would have to change color to white probably because it, when the, there's a stark contrast like that from black to white, you, you usually want the texture in the white area, but you don't want a scream of thread there. So you would switch colors and you're probably going to have to switch colors top and bottom so that you don't have pull through in either direction to worry about balance. Um, that's a really good question because I was working on something last night that was green and white. And in the white areas, I had to change to white. I just could not bring that green, medium green thread over into the white. It just bothered my sensibilities, but everyone is different. So puddle some thread on top of your project after you get the quilt top together and see what you can deal with. <laughs> so it's like take some thread off, just lay it there and then glance over it and see which one, where does your eye go? Like, I like this look of a little bit of a shadow with the white thread on white. I don't like this, even if it's maybe light gray thread on white, I don't wanna see all the thread. So it's it's an audition time there, but a medium gray for piecing would be perfect. Yeah, I think it's good for people to know that you can change colors as many times as you want when quilting. You don't have to do an entire top with just one color. You could do as many colors as you want, yeah. All right, Anne asks, what do you think of buying an ironing board cover made of 100% wool with a linen cotton cover in place of just using a wool mat? Hmm, that would work. Mm -hmm. Definitely, you would get the the um, the value from the, the wool being able to hold heat to help press from both directions. Um, a linen cover over the top um, would keep it from getting scorched. Um, and sometimes you want to be able to change that cover too. I mean, I've just stretched literally a piece of solid fabric over mine and so that I had some color because a lot of times ironing board covers are either kind of a boring color or maybe something you didn't choose because that's what the store has. So you can, you can cover it in anything you want at that point, but it sounds like a good combination to me. Yeah. All right. Robin asks, challenging binding what is the best method to ensure the seam of the binding is actually on the binding and not on the quilt back i can get the front seam perfect however sometimes the seam on the back of the binding is not on the binding but on the quilt itself oh you're talking about machine binding oh that's a challenge and a half <laughs> um I, I tend to be a hand binder, so I'm not the best person to ask that question of. Um, I've done the machine binding before, but I, I tend to end up driving off of that edge and then having to go back and hand stitch it down so you can actually, so that the, the binding is attached well all the way around. Um, mm -hmm. I have a boss who loves to machine bind and she does well, but what you have to do is when you're rolling that binding to the back, it has to be well over and then your stitching has to be back into the binding and to ensure you're actually on it on both sides it's a technique that takes some take some time to acquire mm -hmm. see and i was gonna say i was gonna do the exact opposite because i would stitch it to the back wrap it to the front and i would cut a slightly narrower binding so that way when i fold mm -hmm. it i know that the folded i don't know if i can 
show this with my hands. The folded edge of the binding is, if this is my binding on the back and it comes over this far, when I fold it, it's not going to go past it, right? So then when I stitch it down, I know for sure that my stitching is going to be in that binding. So you can just hide that red color and everything. So yeah, thinner, thinner binding might work too. Yeah, there's more than one way to do these things. In the whole world, we just we come up with innovative ways to tackle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Jan asks, I am a very beginning quilter. I don't have access to the better quality threads locally. Um, Coates and Clark and Guterman threads are very readily available. How do these brands stand up compared to the higher end threads? Um, and will they work well or okay and stand up? Guterman, yes, most definitely. And as a beginner, you know, the Coates and Clark thread, it's fine. I mean, it's a, it's a strong thread because it's made for garment sewing. So it's going to take a beating. It may almost be stronger than your cotton fabric. So, you know, if, if we're practicing our skill, we don't have to use the highest quality right away because those are things that you're practicing on getting your skills up. Maybe you're making them into pot holders. It won't matter there. So you can use up that Coates and Clark thread there. The Goodman thread is a very good thread. Um, a lot of people love that as as um, quilt thread. So you've got you've got it in your in your uh, collection already. Yeah, I've used Coots and Clark for years. That's why I think I sewed on mm -hmm. for the first I don't know 10, 15 years. Like it's just, <laughs> and I'm sure it's all those things are still held up. So you, um, yeah, it's definitely a good thread too. So, all right, um, Elizabeth asks, what batting do you suggest using for hand quilting, and can I use a longer needle? <laughs> That's that's always, that's a really good question because hand quilting is its own monster. And when you look at the size needles for hand quilting, they are these little bitty tiny little things that I can hardly hold on to. But that's what hand quilters use. So find maybe the longest one of those out there. Um, I think the biggest thing is that you realize and get the technique down of rocking that needle back and forth through um, your quilt sandwich. And you will find that that shorter needle is sturdier and easier to take two or three stitches than a long needle is to maneuver through all of that. So you will like that shorter needle once you get used to it. Um, trying to think the other part of that question was, I was so um, a needle. Batting, what batting do you suggest using? Okay. You need to find a, a batting that does not have a scrim. Scrim is kind of a, almost an invisible stabilizer that they put onto batting that helps us when we're loading it onto long arm machines and when we're um, laying it out to do machine quilting on, even if it's a domestic machine, it helps keep that batting in its shape so we can tug on it some and it doesn't distort. So find 100% cotton batting without scrim, make sure it's labeled that way, or use a wool batting. Either of those, the needle will slide very nicely through and you'll have a lot more success making your nice even little stitches and you won't wear out your fingers trying to pull a needle through a scrim on the back of um, a batting. And why do I know this? I tried it. Does not work well. Do not do this. <laughs> you will have your fingers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Julianne asks, I am a beginning quilter. When making a quilt, do... Does every seam have to nest? Is it okay to have a few that do not nest? Oh, there are always times that don't nest. Yeah. That's that's nothing new. <laughs> Nested seams are nice if you can get seam allowances, one going one and one going the other, so you have a little flatter intersection, but there are always times when they will buckle up on top of each other and so realize you have done nothing wrong, that mm -hmm. that is going to happen in your quilting and there are going to be thick spots. Not every quilt is super thin and perfectly flat. So um, some instructions are written so that you get more nesting seams and a little flatter, but there are times when it's inevitable. They will end up one on top of the other. So you haven't done anything wrong. You're good to go. I always just make them nest. Like if, I, if they <laughs> land on top of each other, I'll just come in there about a half inch from the edge. I'm gonna clip it and I'm gonna make it go the way that I think it should go. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I've done that too. A little snip and flip that seam in the other direction and exactly. no one's gonna see once it's quilted, it's covered up and stabilized and it's ready to go. See, I like that you even have a cool name for it, the snip and flip. I love it, okay. 
All right. Doris asks, sometimes boutiques are very difficult to figure out which is the right side. Is there a trick or is there a right side? It's going to be my follow up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after having seen boutiques actually created in Bali, I, I would say that you have purchased both sides. <laughs> um, there are slight differences from the right to the wrong side. Mm -hmm. And there aren't the cues that we normally have with reg, um, quilting fabrics. We usually look to the selvage when we have a lighter um, dyes and lighter um, appearance to the back side of those fabrics. So we automatically know which is the right and the wrong side. When it comes to the batik fabrics, they are stretched out, open, stamped with wax, dyed, and then washed that wax away. So we don't have a selvage edge, nothing that indicates to us the right or wrong. So when I have worked on batiks, and you can see the quilt behind me, all those pinks are all batiks. Um, when I would pull the pieces into what I'm working on or when I'm going to cut, if I'm having to cut unusual shapes, but in that one where they were all rectangles over and over or strips, I would quickly glance at the print if there is a little design to it. One side is a little clearer than the other. If you have to go like, pretend you're at the eye doctor, A or B, A <laughs> or B, and you can't tell the difference, no one else is gonna tell the difference. Mm -hmm. If you quickly see A and then B, and one side says, I'm more clear than the other, use that as your right side. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, no one's ever gonna notice. Agreed. Absolutely. All right. We have time for a couple more questions here. Honey asks, free motion quilting is my favorite part of quilting. Should I invest in a straight stitch only industrial machine? Something like a Janome was her brand. Okay. Um, if it's your love and it's in your budget, sure. <laughs> yep. That's the biggest thing. If it's in your budget and it's not going to stretch you too far, you can go that direction. Um, it will give you usually a longer throat plates area so that you can maneuver quilts underneath there. It's fabulous that you found a part of quilting that you enjoy because not everyone will say that free motion quilting is their favorite part. So you may be um, walking into a business if you don't be careful and don't tell everybody you love it. So well. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. It is an investment. And if you really do enjoy that and having that more, that space to maneuver the, your quilts under there, that's one direction to go. Yep, absolutely. All right, Joan asks, uh, what is the rule to when pressing a seam open uh, or which direction if it doesn't say which way to press? There really isn't a, a hard and fast rule when it comes to pressing. Some quilters are die hard press all seams open. Others, go in the direction that is the darker print to hide the seam allowance a little bit. Um, and sometimes it's bas it, it basically tells you which direction it wants to go. So yeah. maybe you've, you've pieced this section here and a, and a sashing is gonna go next to it. And you've all these seam allowances feeding into this seam where you're putting the sashing on. Do you really think that the fibers are gonna wanna press back on themselves? No, they wanna go towards the sashing. It's all one continuous piece. So there are times when the quilt tells you which direction it's going to go for pressing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes patterns will give you indicators with arrows on pressing. And sometimes it's up to us. And usually in that case, press towards the darker of the two fabrics. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. I like the one where the quilt tells you which way to go because I think that's the sometimes yeah. the easiest way to do it too. Yeah. So, <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much for answering everyone's quilting questions. I hope everyone, if they got their question in here, it was answered. Um, and if not, save those for next time we have Colleen back to answer even more quilting questions. So thank you again.